Uh, does this help? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, first, thanks to the Wellfleet Library. Thanks to Betsy yes. for Andy Lane and everybody connected with the, this amazing library, right? It's really, those of you who've been at libraries at other places <laughs> know that this is a special place. Yeah. And I want to thank the Cape Codders for Peace and Justice. Uh, they are a valiant group. How many times I've driven down Route 6 in bad weather? I was driving bad weather. Uh, and there they are, out in the rain or snow or whatever, uh, you know, with their signs. You know, they're quite a group. So I'm happy to be sponsored by them. So uh, I think my talk is advertised as what, the myth of the good war. Oh, okay, so maybe that's what I'll talk about. <laughs> Sometimes you obey instructions. Okay, well actually, uh, I have another title for this talk, which is roughly similar, uh, and that is Three Holy Wars, Three Holy Wars. Now, of course, when you hear holy wars, you're not really sure what is meant. Are they religious wars? No. <laughs> By three holy wars, I mean that there are three wars in American history which are untouchable, uncriticizable, right? Three wars with each. You mustn't say anything about those three wars to bring uh, any question at all about them uh, that may doubt their goodness, you know. And, and when I, I tell you what these are, you'll recognize immediately. I mean, you ever hear anybody say anything bad about the Revolutionary War? <laughs> no. The British, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, really, especially here in Boston, Massachusetts, and right, and all the Liberty Bells and Sons of Liberty and Concord and Lexington and, and Bunker Hill, right? Oh no, the Revolutionary War. What's that? Is there a, a voice in the crowd? <laughs> uh, speakers are very sensitive to voices in the crowd. <laughs> Especially when you don't know what they're saying. <laughs> they might be criticizing you like you're criticizing war. But no, you, war, you, nobody criticized the Revolutionary War. It's, it's very obvious. It's a war for independence against England, oh, right? A war in which the United States was formed, created. You don't, you don't fool with that. Civil War? Oh, war to end slavery. <laughs> you for slavery. <laughs> how, how, can you, how can you say anything critical about the Civil War? And we have all these you know, movies glory and, you know, and all black soldiers are enlisted and, and blacks fight in the Civil War. And, of course, there's Lincoln and, you know, all that, all that uh, hoopla. So far, pardon me for using a word like that, because the word hoopla suggests something, uh, hmm, not quite uh, praiseworthy hoopla about the Civil War. And then, of course, there's World War II, the holiest war of all, really, the good war. And those of you who read Studs Terkel's oral history, which I recommend to you, you know, Studs Terkel wrote all these oral histories, and one of them was called The Good War, about World War II. He interviewed all these people who had been involved in World War II, people in the military, people who were civilians, all sorts of people who were in one way or another connected with World War II, called it a good war. However, his wife suggested to him that he put quotation marks around good war. Good war in quotation marks. What does that suggest? 
oh, maybe there's some doubt about whether it is completely, purely a good war. Uh, and in fact, his, his wife had read all the testimonies about World War II, and after reading all the testimonies, oh, she wondered, should we simply call it a good war and let it go at that? No. Quotation marks around the good war. And yes, World War II, sacrosanct. And we, we know how the culture uh, glorifies World War II, really. You know, the greatest generation and all these movies about D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge and Iwo Jima and, uh, well, you know, the heroism, the military heroism, how we love military heroism. We don't have much about anti-military heroism. A lot of anti-military heroism. But no, it's military heroism. That's what kids are, grow up on. That's what we teach kids. We teach kids about our military heroes. We don't teach them about our anti-military heroes. Uh, so it's no wonder that kids are, are vulnerable to military recruiters. Wow, they can become part of another greatest generation. But, uh, so I am a troublemaker. <laughs> I insist on taking a critical look at these three holy wars. Uh, not to denounce them, not to simply push them aside, not to change them from good to bad, and you know, as simple as that, let it, no. But I want to introduce some complicating and troubling questions into this whole notion of the good war, the holy war. Just want us to think about that, because we don't think about that. These wars that are unquestioned, when something is unquestioned, it means you don't think about it. <laughs> you, you don't ask questions about it. But I want to ask questions about it. I'm not saying I have all the answers about it, but I think we have to start thinking about it for good reason, not, not for historical reasons, not, not for what some people think is the uh, reason for doing history, to learn what really happened in the past, so you can have an accurate picture of what happened in the past. That's not my intent. The past is past. <laughs> no, the important thing about the past, and this is you know, been my life's work as a historian. The important thing about the past, the important thing about history, is what does it tell us about today, and, and what does it tell us about tomorrow, and what does it tell us about what we might do in the world. Uh, uh, so the the reason for examining these holy wars is not a historical, scholarly, academic reason. Uh, no. The reason has to do with now, it has to do with tomorrow. It has to do with how prone will we be, and how prone will our children and grandchildren be to accept the idea of war as possibly good. Because once you have a history of good wars, right, once you have wars to point to that uh, are noble, uh, fought for good causes, uh, once you have that in your history, well, you have something to point to. You have a, a, a model. Yes, you see, it's possible to have good wars. And maybe this is one of them. How many times has World War II been pointed to uh, as an analogy with the ugly wars that followed World War II? The wars that everybody pretty much everybody acknowledges are not good wars, you know. Well, Korea, people are, don't know much about that, but Vietnam, certainly, no. Iraq, no. People, by now, people do not think those are good wars, Vietnam, Iraq. But have you noticed how these acknowledged bad wars are justified by pointing to the good war. No. We mustn't appease Saddam Hussein, right? The, all the images of World War II come into being. Churchill, Lyndon Johnson called Ziem, 
the, <laughs> the leader of South Vietnam, the puppet leader of South Vietnam, Lyndon Johnson called him the Winston Churchill of Asia. <laughs> yeah. The, well, oh, we, we mustn't give in to Iraq because, or Iran, or any of these miserable countries. What right do they have <laughs> to stand up to us? You know, we, no, we mustn't because that would be appeasement. And appeasement is a word that goes back to World War II, right? The appeasement, Chamberlain, appeasement, Munich, th those, those words come back uh, to uh, presumably justify the wars that we th engage in since World War II. So I'm saying that there is a reason for uh, questioning the goodness of these wars uh, because if, if there are serious questions to be raised about the goodness of these wars, then you are undermining that certainty about wars being good, that certainty of the possibility of good wars. Uh, you're undermining the, these analogies that people use you know, when they think, oh, you know, this is like World War II. <laughs> Ho Chi Minh is another Hitler. Uh, Saddam Hussein is another Hitler. It's, and so, you know, it's, it's uh, so, yeah, there's a present reason for going into the past. There's a present reason, future reason, for looking at these historic events and re-examining them. So, uh, I'll say something about each of these wars. Uh, come to think of it, I should uh, keep note of the time, because I could spend a few hours on each war, <laughs> and you would get thirsty, <laughs> and I would get thirsty. Yeah. So. Uh, I'll pretend to look at my watch from time to time <laughs> and, 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 and to care. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, one of the things that's done in accepting a war, like, like the Revolutionary War, and it's true also of other wars, that you generally only look at one side of the balance sheet. And by the balance sheet, I mean uh, <laughs> you draw up a, a list on both sides of the balance sheet. These are the good things that came out of the war. And then on the other side of the balance sheet is the cost of the war. And I'm, what I'm claiming, and uh, what I'm saying is that the cost of the war is usually glossed over because the goodness of the war overshadows everything else. If, some, if there's a good outcome, if it's done for a good cause, well, whatever the cost was, we're not going to look at it too closely. It was worth it. Now, wait a while. I don't think so. I, I don't think you can ignore the other side of the balance sheet. I don't think you can ignore the cost of the war. I insisted, even though you have some good things on the good side of the balance sheet, yes, well, we won independence from England. That's on the positive side of the balance sheet. But I insist that you don't simply leave it at that, that you look at the cost of the war. Well, just, let's just take the cost in human life. Any of you know how many uh, soldiers died in the Revolutionary War? I would guess that not too many people know because it's never talked about. And, and because people assume it's an insignificant number, right? Yeah, there was the Battle of Bunker Hill. There was, Valley Forge, there was the Battle of Saturday. But you know, it's no, no big deal. You, 
there's no point in paying attention to that. We won the war, we got independence from England. 25,000 casualties. There may have been 50,000, but you probably know by now that casualty figures in war are very crude. Uh, no, nobody really knows. There'll be, <laughs> there'll be disagreements up to a million. <laughs> I'm serious. People, how many people died in Vietnam? Oh, I think two million. Or oh, maybe three million. We're not sure. Really? Imagine not being sure. <laughs> a million people just be, well, so, yeah, people don't know. 25,000, well, 25,000 is not much, right? 25,000, what's 25,000 lives if you win independence against England? 25,000 is less than half of the number of men who were soldiers who were killed in, in Vietnam. But wait a while. What was our population then? It was about three million. If you extrapolate, if you, right? If, what would 25,000 uh, dead mean in relation to the present population? Uh, it would be two and a half million. Two and a half million dead. So that if you want to say we are winning independence against England <laughs> today, right? Let's pretend that today uh, we are, have been subservient to England and we want to win independence instead of, as is true, England is subservient to us and wants to win independence, <laughs> you see. Uh, uh, would you be willing to sacrifice two and a half million? Would you accept that two and a half million people as a cost for uh, gaining independence? Might you not say, well, hey, we do want independence, but uh, is there another way, <laughs> another way we can do this without fighting a war that costs the lives of two and a half million people? Uh, so that it's, so there, on that side of the ledger, you have to put the human cost of war in every one of these good wars and only then, and acknowledging the good side, but then at least you have a, a, an honest balance sheet, not, not a, a distorted balance, not a one-sided balance sheet, an honest balance sheet, and then you can make a judgment. If you decide, oh yeah, it would be worth two and a half million to win independence from it, okay. You can make that judgment if you want, especially if none of those two and a half million are related to you. Uh, but what about other factors? There's another thing that is generally, another question that is generally not asked about good wars. Good wars are generally based on a single criterion of something good that was won. And there are other things, peripheral issues, other issues, side issues, but they seem like side issues, that usually aren't examined. Uh, by that I mean is, okay, the colonists win independence from England. Uh, who gains? There's an interesting question. Who gains from victory in a war? Now governments that fight wars, because it's governments that initiate wars and governments that fight wars, governments would like us to believe that all of us gain from a war. And that's not necessarily true. There are people who gain, and there are other people who don't gain. Did black slaves gain from the Revolutionary War? The slavery before the war, slavery after the war. Did the new government ushered in by the Constitution do away with slavery? No, it legitimized slavery. In fact, it declared slaves as three-fifths of a person. Uh, diminished the, the humanness of slaves. Well, in fact, blacks did not rush. You would think if the Revolutionary War had anything to do with not just winning independence from England, but, but winning 
liberation for black people, they would have rushed to the colors, fought for their own, no, they didn't rush at all. Washington did not want blacks in the Revolutionary Army. The English uh, recruited blacks into the revolution, because to recruit them into the, would have meant promising them freedom. No, the, this government, the Washington, Madison, Jefferson, all slave owners, they were not gonna promise freedom. The British were willing to, and they did. And only after the British began to enlist blacks, only then did the uh, Continental Army begin to slowly enlist blacks. So in asking who gains from the war, well, I have to rule out black people as gaining from the Revolutionary War. What about, now here's a, a group that we don't even think about in relation to the Revolutionary War. Indians, <laughs> Native Americans, they're here. They live here. They're on this continent, <laughs> right? Our roads in Cape Cod <laughs> are named after them, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're, they're, it's their land. We Europeans have come in and gradually, gradually encroached on their land. Uh, killing them if they get in the way. Uh, did Indians gain from the Revolutionary War? Did their situation, what was their situation? It was a tremulous one because, you know, they're, they're these colonists on the East Coast and the colonists want to go westward into Indian territory and so there's a lot of tension there. And so what, what do Indians gain from our independence uh, from England, not only do they gain nothing, it's worse for them because before the revolution, before the Revolutionary War, the British have set a line to the west of the colonies, uh, uh, roughly along the Appalachians, but they've set a line in 1763, it's called the Proclamation of 1763, and they've said, colonists cannot go beyond this line, because beyond this line, that's Indian territory. You know, it's not that the British were <laughs> feeling kindly towards the Indians, they didn't want trouble, right? <laughs> so it snows, stay behind this line, and don't go into Indian territory. What happens when we win the revolution? We wipe out that line. No more barrier. Now we can move westward, and we do. And in fact, the next hundred years consists of our taking over the rest of the continent and in the process massacring our Indian tribes, driving them into a smaller and smaller part of the continent. Now Indians are not gaining from the Revolutionary War. These are people, aren't they? They're just like white uh, colonists who can celebrate independence. Black people are people, Indians are people. Shouldn't they be considered when you uh, count up the cost and when you uh, look at the balance sheet? Working people, <laughs> poor people. Were poor people the beneficiaries of the Revolutionary War? Well, uh, did poor people rush to join Washington's army? No, they did not. That had to be conscription. And the rich could get out of conscription by paying a certain sum of money. This was a precedent which was set and which was then followed in the Civil War. Uh, poor white people were not anxious to join the army. However, they were made promises. Oh. We'll give you some land. It's like, we'll give you a GI Bill of Rights. We'll give you some land. Your status will go up. Uh, not only that, in the army, if you're in the army, you'll get paid and you'll, you know, your life now is not that great. Uh, well, you know, the usual situation. You join the military and if your life uh, up to this point has not been a very satisfying one, then a young guy and you don't know what your future brings, yeah, join the military, you'll get a uniform, you'll get a gun, uh, you'll get some status, you might win some medals, if 
if you stay alive and come out of the war intact, you'll get a little land. Uh, wasn't it? <laughs> so poor people did not simply flock to the revolutionary banner, uh, thinking that, oh, this is a war for us. They had very personal reasons, and, uh, and many of them did not join. And when they did join the army, Washington's army, and they discovered that they were not being treated well. They discovered that the officers in the army, who came mostly from the upper classes, the officers in the army were getting fine clothes and shoes and good food. And they were getting salaries that were being paid. The GIs were not getting good clothes, not getting shoes, uh, not getting good food, not getting paid. As a result, there were mutinies in the Revolutionary Army. Now, how many of you who have studied American history in school learned that there were mutinies in the Revolutionary Army? I would guess not many. I went all through, right, the education of a historian, <laughs> right up to the PhD. How proud I am. <laughs> all through the education of a historian. Did I ever learn that there were mutinies in the Revolutionary Army? Not at all. Not a word. But there were. Thousands of soldiers mutinied. Thousands. It was serious. Washington had to deal with it. He could, and there were too many to suppress, so he, he made concessions, concessions in order to appease them and, and stop the mutiny. That was the mutiny of the Pennsylvania Line, as it was called. Shortly after that, the concessions were made, many of which were not followed through on, as usually happens when promises are made and they're not fulfilled. But shortly after the mutiny in the, in the Pennsylvania line, there was a mutiny in the New Jersey line. A smaller mutiny, not thousands, hundreds. Washington said, well, we can deal with this. We don't have to make concessions here. We will execute the leaders of this mutiny. And Washington ordered the execution of the leaders of the mutiny. They were taken out and shot. And the, the fellow mutineers were given orders to shoot them. Don't learn about this. All of this is to say that the Revolutionary War, like all wars, was a class war. You're not supposed to say things like that. You're not supposed to bring up the issue of class when you're dealing with war. War is, we're all in it together. We're all one class, we're all in one patriotic body. No. Wars affect different classes differently. Wars affect the rich and the poor differently. The benefits are not allocated equally to rich and poor from a war that's won. And in fact, when these working people, farmers, come back from the war to take up their little plots of land which are given to them, what do they find? <laughs> they find uh, that they're being treated like heroes and they're being thanked uh, for the service they gave in the Revolutionary War? Hardly. Now they're going to be taxed on that land. Taxed in such a way that they can't even pay those taxes. And then when they can't pay the taxes, their land, their farms, their livestock are going to be taken away from them. That's what leads to Shays' Rebellion. Right? That's something people learn about, right? Especially in Massachusetts, I think. At least they learn that it's something on a multiple choice test. <laughs> <laughs> Shays' Rebellion, oh yeah. Shays' Rebellion was serious. Shays' Rebellion with thousands of farmers and those towns in western Massachusetts surrounding the courthouses, not allowing the auctions to go on. Uh, and uh, an army had to be brought out to suppress them, an army uh, financed by the rich merchants of Boston. Uh, it was crushed. But it was a sign, and for us looking at, a sign to us of, hey, 
What was this war fought for, and for whom was it fought, and who benefited from it, and who was betrayed by it? Working people were betrayed. And they'd seen their brothers and friends die in that war, and now they were being betrayed. Uh, there's a, the Chase Rebellion takes place in 1786. Many of you know the date 1787, because that's the date of the Constitutional Convention. That's the date when the 55 men gather in Philadelphia, mostly rich white men, <laughs> really, gather a representative group, you might say, as representative as our Congress and Senate are today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, 1987, they gather in Philadelphia and they draw up a constitution. Why do they draw up a constitution? Well, I know what I learned in school, and I'll bet they're still teaching in school. We had a weak central government. We needed a strong central government. So we had a constitution. We created a constitution to give us a strong central government. We can be proud, because we don't want our government to be strong. Well, yes. <laughs> There's some truth to that. Well, it's true that a strong central government was set up. For what reason? Well, if you want to know the reason for the strong central government being set up, look at the correspondence that went back and forth among the founding fathers after Shays' Rebellion. Shays' Rebellion worried them. It was, by the way, it was not only taking place in Massachusetts, although we in Massachusetts, we learn about Shays' Rebellion. There were similar rebellions in other states of farmers. Founding fathers were worried about that. Uh, one of them, General Henry Knox of Massachusetts, I'm always proud of people from Massachusetts, especially if they're generals. And <laughs> Henry Knox, who one of Washington's colleagues in the army, after Shays' Rebellion, he wrote to Washington, and he said something like this, I, I can't, actually reproduce his elegant language. You know, these founding fathers, they spoke, wrote very elegantly. You compare, really, the, whatever you can say about them, they, they knew how to use the English language. Compare them to our congressmen and senators today. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. But so Knox, Knox writes uh, to George Washington after Shays' Rebellion, and he says, and I'll paraphrase, in our own crude 21st century language. Uh, he says, you know, these people, there was these people, <laughs> these people who fought in the revolution, they think that because we won the war that they are entitled to an equal share of the wealth of this country. <laughs> no. <laughs> the Constitutional Convention is convened in the shadow of Shays' rebellion and with the fear of future rebellions. A strong central government was set up not just because, oh, it's nice to have a strong central government. The strong central government was set up so you could have a government strong enough to suppress rebellion, to suppress working class rebellions, to suppress slave rebellions, to protect settlers and expansionists who move into Indian territory, a government that can raise an army. Yeah. So, you know, before you simply rush, say, wow, how good to have a strong central government. Strong for what? For what reason was that strength created? Uh, so, I introduce these elements uh, that we don't usually think about when we think about the Revolutionary War, rah, rah, Bunker Hill. <laughs> Just. Uh, to make us think more complicated ways about so-called good wars and to ask who benefits from them and who doesn't benefit from them and what is the cost to human cost of the war. Yeah, let's take all of this into consideration and let's put that on the balance sheet. Of, yes, and let's acknowledge it on the good side of the balance Yeah, we win independence from England, okay. But let's have an honest look at that balance sheet and then ask, uh, should we have fought a war for that, given what we know? 
about the results of the war, the benefits of the war, uh, the class character of the war, the casualties of the war. Well, of course, the question comes up, yeah, but don't you want us to have independence from England? <laughs> well, that raises another question, a question that can be raised about all the good wars, and it will come up. If it doesn't come up, I'll bring it up. <laughs> and that is, uh, could we have put something good on the positive side of the balance sheet without that human cost? In other words, could we have won independence from England in a different way? We, we generally don't think of that. That is when you have fought a war and you've won something, independence from England, the end of slavery, Hitler defeated, when you've fought a war and you've seen certain results, it embeds in you the idea that this was the only way it could have done. This is a very important thing to think about, and that is that uh, if something has happened in history, if, if a certain scenario has unfolded in a certain way in history, we assume that that's the only way it could have unfolded. Uh, because if we did assume that, we'd have to use our imagination. We'd have to use our imagination and try to imagine something that didn't happen. If something happened, it has a reality, has a strength. If something didn't happen, if it's only a possibility, well, then we have to use our imagination. We have to use our imagination. Could independence from England have been won with, without that human cost and with different kind of results for different classes of people? Is that possible? It's worth thinking about. Didn't Canada get independence from England? Pretty much, right? Did they fight a bloody revolutionary war? Granted, every situation is different and you can't simply plaster one, but still, it's worth thinking about. Uh, is it possible that the struggle against England could have gone on in different ways without Valley Forge and without Bunker Hill and without the Battle of Saratoga and without two and a half million people dead? I insist on using that figure to bring us closer to reality. Is it possible? that might have won independence some other way. Uh, have to use our imagination. That's hard. Have to imagine something that didn't, didn't happen as opposed to accepting something that did happen. But I insist that we have to do that. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck with history. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck with doing the same thing over and over again because this is the only way it can be done. Uh, a year before, and here's just a, a, a little historical bit of evidence to just throw into the hopper. Uh, a year before Lexington and Concord, in other words, a year before the fighting began against England, Farmers in western Massachusetts, all over the western Massachusetts, had driven out the British officials from the seats of government, the judges and the local officials, and had taken over much of western Massachusetts. And remember, at that time, you know, Boston, the city was a very small percentage of the Massachusetts population. Ninety percent of the people in Massachusetts lived out in in the country, and in those places in the country, the British were driven out without a war. They were driven out by huge numbers of people that gathered and uh, made it impossible for them to continue. I mean, uh, there, there's a book been written about that, a book which hasn't gotten a lot of attention because very often books that tell the truth do not get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
that tell you things you don't want to hear, a book by a man named Ray Raphael, who he wrote a book actually called The People's History of the American Revolution. People's History of the American Revolution, I recommend it, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> but he also wrote another book called The First American Revolution, and it's about those events that take place before Lexington and Concord, in which people nonviolently, without, that is without a war, take over. And so you wonder, at least makes you wonder, was it, could it have been possible without a war for the colonists to resist England, to build up a, an underground, to wage a kind of guerrilla warfare, to, to make it impossible for the British to govern without a war? And after all, when, it, when a place becomes impossible to govern, even imperial powers retreat from them. They, you know, uh, they can't control the situation, and, and the, so they leave. It's worth thinking about. Okay. Um, so much for that holy war. <laughs> <laughs> The Civil War. Well, on, on, the, on the plus side, right, the balance sheet, slavery. I mean, you can't, uh, you can't deny that the Civil War is fought and slavery is ended. But even while not forgetting that, I mean, that is very, very important. Well, not forgetting that, it's worthwhile at least looking at the other side of the balance sheet. <coughs> 600,000 dead in the Civil War. I mean, how many people knew those figures? Most people haven't even thought about it. They know it's a bloody war, okay, but people haven't thought 600,000. In a population of 30 million? 600,000 today would mean we fought a civil war in which five million people died. What if we wanted to end racial segregation? Well, or, or maybe even slavery. Should we fight a war in which five million people die in order to end slavery? Now, of course, we want slavery to end, but is this the only way it could have been done with a war that takes 600,000 lives? There are countries in other parts of the world and in the Western Hemisphere that did away with slavery and without a bloody war. All over Latin America and the West Indies. Uh, it's worth thinking about. It's not that we want to retain slavery. No, we do want to end slavery. But again, have to let our imaginations go. Is it possible? Slavery might have been ended some other way. Maybe it would have taken longer. This is a very important factor. If you want to avoid horrendous violence and accomplish something, you may have to wait longer. Uh, the nice thing about violence, it's fast. If you want, you want to accomplish something fast, violence will do it. If, but very often you can accomplish the same thing without violence if you have a more orchestrated plan uh, of not submission, not appeasement, not giving in, not a a allowing the status quo to go on, but gradually eroding the status quo. Think of South Africa. The African National Congress, which was, you know, represented the black population of South Africa, uh, the African National Congress could have, uh, they're facing apartheid, which is a kind of slavery. R certainly, not far from slavery, apartheid. Uh, they could have fought 
the majority of the population in South Africa, they could afford a bloody, so they could have gotten arms from the outside. There was, they had friends and sympathizers and, uh, and uh, they could have instigated an armed rebellion to overthrow the apartheid regime. And it would have won, probably won. How long would it take? Maybe a couple of years. Who knows? Two, three, four, we don't know exactly. Uh, how many people would die in the course of that struggle? Oh, we don't know, a million, <laughs> two million, most of them black, right? But at the end of it, apartheid would be over. And people would say, that's the only way it could have been done. Just as they say about the Revolutionary War, that's the only way we could have won independence. About the Civil War, that's the only way could have ended slavery. By the way, just a footnote about ending slavery after the Civil War. Uh, we did not really end slavery. <laughs> it's not simply, oh, they're, they were slaves and now they're free. No, they weren't free. They were put back into serfdom, not slavery, but serfdom after the Civil War. They were left without resources. And they had to go back and work now for the same plantation owners that they were enslaved by, now but with the same kinds of restrictions on them because they had no resources. Uh, so this, to say slavery was ended, not quite true. And as you know, the black people then went through 100 years after the, the supposed end of slavery and after the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments were passed to the Constitution promising racial equality and so on. For 100 years after the supposed end of slavery, black people are segregated and live as second-class human beings. Uh, so while on a positive side you say, oh, we ended slavery, well, you have to put quotation marks around end of slavery. Not quite. So, yeah, these are things worth considering. I'll go quickly to World War II, to the next holy war. Every one of these, of course, there's a lot more to be said about each one of these situations, but uh, World War II is especially difficult because for one thing, it's in our time. You know, if not us, it's our fathers and, or grandfathers. You know, that, that is, we know people who were in World War II. And uh, I was in World War II. <laughs> uh, I almost forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I volunteered for the Air Force. I was an enthusiastic bombardier. I went over and I bombed cities in Europe, uh, France, Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, France, uh, uh, the good war. Fascism. Why did I enlist? Fascism. Right? Fa what could be more obvious than the need to defeat fascism? And what, what more ugly phenomenon is there in the world and fascism, Nazism, and all of that. So yes, I, that's why I enlisted. And that's why once I enlisted, I didn't question anything. Because this is the way things are. And it's an interesting psychological trick that's played upon us, or that we play upon ourselves. Uh, and that is once you make a decision that you are the good guys and they are the bad guys. In other words, once you've settled the moral issue about right and wrong, it's settled. You don't have to think about it anymore. From that point on, anything you do is okay. You don't question it. You're the good guys, they're the bad guys. Now you could kill them all. You could kill people who have nothing to do with the bad guys. You could kill 600,000 civilians in Germany. Who are these civilians? They're not all Nazis. They're like Americans during the Vietnam War, right? Uh, 
kill another 600,000 civilians in Japan. But we don't question that. It's a good war. It's the right thing. They're the bad. We're good. <laughs> uh, very important to stop at every inch along the way of a historical event and ask questions again and again. What are you doing and why are you doing this? Because uh, otherwise you will be, uh, as General Groves said about Harry Truman and the dropping of the bomb, you'd be like a little boy on a toboggan going down the hill, can't stop. Uh, but after the war, I began to think about the war. Not that I had different thoughts about fascism. No, fascism is still evil, and it's good to get rid of fascism. But, but, 50 million people died in World War II. That has to be put on one side of the balance sheet. OK, on the other side of the balance sheet, Hitler is gone. Mussolini is gone. Japanese military junta is gone. But is fascism gone? <laughs> Have we, you know, when, when, I, when I was discharged from the Air Force, I got this letter from General Marshall. He was a general among, of, of, over all the generals. <laughs> and uh, a letter of congratulation, personal letter, of course, to me. <laughs> to me and 16 million others. <laughs> you know, uh, congratulations. You know, you have played a part, and we have won this war, and it will be a new world. Well, <laughs> no, it wasn't a new world. It hasn't been a new world. I mean, it's, you know, like asking questions. Did we really free the slaves? <laughs> uh, uh, and 50 million people are dead. Uh, isn't it at least worth asking the question? Could fascism, and granted, we don't want to submit to fascism. We don't want countries to take over other countries, and et cetera, et cetera. We, no, we don't want any of that. We want, we'd like to do something about fascism. But is it possible that we did something about it in the crudest possible way? That is, with war, which is the crudest way you can deal with any problem, the, the most unfocused, bluntest, undifferentiated act of violence, a series of acts of violence, is it possible we could have found other ways to deal with Hitler and fascism? Not, not appeasement, uh, you know, oh wow, you mustn't have appeasement, of course not. But in between total war and appeasement, couldn't there be a hundred other possibilities? Of, of resistance, of guerrilla warfare, of sabotage, of, uh, something that would take longer, granted. War, you can get rid of Hitler in five years. How long did it take? Yeah, something like that. But what if, what if you had a different plan and a different scenario? Uh, is it possible that you could have defeated fascism? Uh, by a more sophisticated set of responses of resistance which would not involve the crudity of war in which both sides become monsters. Because that's what happens in war. In war, they are the monsters and then you become monsters. In war, both sides become monsters. The Japanese commit atrocities, we commit atrocities. The Germans bomb civilian populations, we bomb civilian population. Uh, and uh, that's what war does. War poisons everybody who engages in it. And at the end of it, you've won something, but then when you look carefully at it, what have you won? And how long does it last? And, and shouldn't you consider, even though it's very hard, to use your imagination and to consider that there might have been other scenarios, shouldn't you at least begin to think about it? Because if you don't begin to think about it, you'll be stuck in this very common, 
cultural acceptance of war as the way to solve things. And then the next president who comes along and says, and he could be a Democrat as well as a Republican, because Democrats have as good a record of going to war as Republicans. Uh, the, the next president comes along and says, something has happened here in this part of the world, and, or an explosion has taken place in Philadelphia, or something has happened and we've got to go to war. You don't even think about it. Yeah, that's the way to go. <laughs> but 9-11 has taken place. Invade Afghanistan. Bomb Afghanistan. Anybody stop and think? Uh, what is that going to do? <laughs> and how will that change things? Uh, will that do away with terrorism in the world? Uh, so, I'm suggesting that we have to uh, at least begin to question these so good, good wars because we want, I think, to reach a situation in the world where war is not acceptable, no matter what reason is given you. You know. You know. No. Not, not acceptable. War in our time is always a war against innocent people, especially children. But no matter what the objective, however noble the objective, will get rid of this tyrant or stop this aggression, whatever the good reason is on the good side of the ledger, on the bad side of the ledger will be huge numbers of innocent people will die, and a large number of them children. And the world will be poisoned once again with the germ of war, and we'll again, we'll continue our addiction to war. That's another thing to think about. War is addictive, and the more shots you take of it, the more addicted you become. And we have to break our habit. Thank you. So, Oh, okay. So, what, what, I'll, have to, I'll have to deal with questions. I'm going to have to deal with questions. So, they should be able to hear me. How many Americans saw Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor was bombed, we were attacked? Assuming that Pearl Harbor is us, that's assuming that Pearl Harbor is our country. Pearl Harbor was our colony. Our colony. One of our colonies was attacked. A colony in which we had amassed a huge military force. And <clears throat> when you look into the history, and this, none of this is to absolve Japan, you know, uh, at all, of cruelty and what they did in China and so on. But the fact is that uh, without subscribing to the theory that, oh, Roosevelt orchestrated and knew, well, actually, the United States government knew that the Japanese were planning to attack us. And they also knew that Pearl Harbor was a likely place. So it's not that they knew that, oh, exactly on December 7th, these warplanes would come over and attack Pearl Harbor. But it wasn't simply we were there in a sense <laughs> and had no idea, and this is a surprise attack. It wasn't totally a surprise. There was an admiral who, uh, who, before Pearl Harbor, said, you know, why are we concentrating our Navy at Pearl Harbor? Why don't we withdraw from Pearl Harbor? You know, we make it an inviting target. <clears throat> um, you know, we don't need it. It's a possession of ours. That admiral was removed from duty. Really. So uh, there's a lot of history behind, you know, the, the Japanese were, it was not simply an unsolicited and uh, unprovoked attack on Pearl Harbor. And again, I'm not defending the attack on Pearl Harbor, yes. Uh, 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 although I might say it was an attack on a military target as opposed to the attacks we then leveled on Japan, which were not on military targets, but on civilian targets. 
uh, like the bombing of Tokyo in the spring of 45, when we kill 100,000 people in Tokyo in one night. <laughs> How many Americans know about that? They know about Hiroshima. They may, may know about Dresden. Do they know about Tokyo in the spring of 45? Uh, 100,000? Anyway, uh, so the Pearl Harbor is more complicated. And the question is, so what do you do if they attack Pearl Harbor? Well, maybe you don't declare war. <laughs> maybe you withdraw. Okay, it's not our colony anymore, it's your colony. Well. Uh, uh, at different stages of the development of this thing, you have to figure at each stage what do you do, you know? And what do you do to minimize? What do you do to try to represent something moral and at the same time minimize the human cost of, what, of whatever you do? Uh, and uh, I mean, it's not just Pearl Harbor. Oh, Hitler goes into Poland. Well, he wants certain things. <laughs> if we had given him those things, we gave him Czechoslovakia, right? Oh, appeasement. What if we had also given him Poland? <laughs> this is, nobody likes to say this. I mean, it's a, it's a no no. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's treason, really. But, but the, you have to ask questions that haven't been asked. You have to be willing to question everything. And, okay, all right, here's Poland. Here, take this, take that, take this, take that, take. Hey, how much can you take? And at what point are your forces spread thin? And at what point do you stop being able to control the situation? Even during World War II, Hitler was not able to control the outlying districts of his new empire. He was not able to control events in Norway or Bulgaria. Bulgaria could say to him, we're not, as they did, we're not gonna send these Jews to Auschwitz. And he had to go along with it. He could, could. This is what happens with empires. Empires expand and expand. And then at a certain point, uh, they lose power, they lose control, and they begin to disintegrate. It takes longer, of course, for that to happen than if you fight a war and get rid of that evil empire. We don't know what might have happened, right? You're saying, we have no idea what Hitler would have done, right? We would know what terrible things he might have done. And, and it's true. But what happens then? is you justify the atrocities that you commit by the frightening thought of what atrocities the other side may commit. And it, it's a very common defense of an immoral act that it's done to prevent another immoral act. And you take Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which, which is an example of that. Why? How? Talk about an immoral act. I mean, next to Auschwitz, let us say. Okay, let's put that aside. But in the whole scheme of immoral acts, Hiroshima and Nagasaki rank near the top of immoral acts. To kill several hundred thousand innocent people deliberately. Uh, why? Uh, oh, to prevent something worse, right? What do they say? We did to prevent, to save lives. And it's interesting. We didn't kill a couple of hundred thousand people in order to save lives. American lives. Huh? American, American, American lives. lives. Oh, that's the difference. <laughs> no, no, really, that's, that's the difference, American lives. If I had said to somebody who, and we're discussing this thing, would you be willing in August of 1945 if you could shorten the war? Because that's what we did, right? With a bomb. We shortened the war. The war was going to come to an end, but we shortened it with a bomb. Would you be willing in order to shorten the war to kill 100,000 American children? Well, the answer is obvious. How about 100,000 Japanese children? That's what we did. What does that mean? What does that say about us? question of several tens of thousands of American soldiers occupying the islands. That was the question, not children, in that situation. The, the argument is we would have had to invade Japan 
and then the invasion of Japan, and then numbers were thrown around wildly. Truman, who is not a very good mathematician, uh, not good at a lot of things. Oh, a million people in the invasion of Japan, a million people. No, there were no military estimates. Estimates by the military who were planning the invasion of Japan. No estimates by them of a million. No, they, their estimate actually was maybe 35,000 would die in the invasion. However, there's something more important than that. No invasion was necessary. We did not have to invade Japan in order to win the war. It's, the evidence for that is very powerful. I, I recommend to you that you read the most exhaustive bit of research that was done on the dropping of the bomb by Gar Alperovitz called The Decision to Drop the Bomb. Uh, and uh, no, there was no need to invade Japan. And, uh, and so when they talk about a million lives are saved, or even 35,000 lasers, not true. Uh, and in the course of it, we, we killed several hundred thousand people in order to quickly win the war, instead of waiting on maybe weeks, a month, three months. The U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey, which our official <coughs> survey that went into Japan after the war and interviewed all the officials and went over all the evidence, and they came to the conclusion Japan would have surrendered within several months without any dropping of the atomic bomb. So we, we were in a hurry. And of course, there are interesting questions to raise. Why were we in such a hurry? They were really willing to sacrifice so many lives.